how did that get you from working with in the athletics world and building a name there to then working in team sports like the AFL? Well, no, it's a bit of serendipity, I think, because I um, I was working at Little Athletics and I knew that if I wanted to have a career coaching-wise in, well, mainly athletics, I was thinking, I would need to get qualified. And there was a degree came up, first time ever, uh, in coaching. It was sports coaching and it had this little attachment on it, sports coaching and exercise physiology at the mm. Uni of New South Wales. So I did that and Little A's um, allowed me to just work around the schedule of university. So I was working, but I was a student. So I did my sports science degree. And by the time I'd finished, I was asked by the AIS if I would be interested in working with the AIS. And they were just starting a decentralization program. And I was offered the choice. I could either go to Townsville and set up like a satellite program outside of um, Brisbane for the Queensland Academy of Sport, or I could go to Tasmania and set up the first ever Institute for Track and Field in Tasmania. When you're the conditioning coach for a track and field athlete, what's mm. your team look like compared to a football club? Is it just you with the oh, athlete, no. or yeah, you've yeah, got a whole you, team? You, yes, you had a, you had a whole team to do everything. The only support we sort of got in track and field, and we'd be always trying to drum it up, was for media. But I was well trained for that with the Tasmanian Institute of Sport because track and field was a high and is a high profile sport in Tasmania, and as the head of, head. Uh, coach of track and field in Tasmania, uh, you know, I had to drive a lot of that uh, profile that they needed. So that side of it, um, I, I could really adapt quite easily to. But it was just the whole world of football was just so unique and different. But um, I, I just, I, I don't take myself too seriously. I think you, I'm there to get the most out of people. And regardless of the sport, you look at what the needs of the individual are and how mm. can I make you better, not how can I make you better to make me look good? It's how, what do you need? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What have we got to work with? And let's go for it. Along that way, along your, your journey, and I know you're only really at the halfway point there. There's, there's plenty more that you did after Essendon, but uh, who were some strong influences on your career? Um, from Before I got to it? Essendon? Uh, oh, just I, in terms of when you, yeah, becoming an yeah, athletics what, coach as well and just in general. Yeah. So. Oh, no, no, good question, because I, here I am in this country town, and uh, so I, I really fed off uh, the enthusiasm. I said the, the local butcher, and he became a very good friend of mine. His name was Don Parks, and he's still in the town of Yast uh, and still involved in athletics. But Don's enthusiasm was infectious, and it was through Don. I started reading more and more. I'm working at the hospital, but I'm reading books, and, and I was always a fan. Of what, what young athlete at the time, or even anyone in the world, uh, every, you, you speak to any kid in the, in the world right now and they all know who Usain Bolt is. They can tell you who Usain Bolt. Well, when mm. I was a kid, my Usain Bolt was a superstar called Carl Lewis. And I looked at everything Carl Lewis did. And when you look at Carl Lewis, even compared to Usain Bolt, technically he's a better runner. Biggest thing you look for in a good player. So if we reframe that into, you know, developing players, what, what do you try and look for and how do you know oh, yeah, that guy's going somewhere um, or does it vary too much? Oh, no, no, it doesn't vary. I think you look for the underlying things. You can't coach attitude and uh, you look for how, how hungry are they and despite setbacks that they have, uh, how, how eager are they to push through? You know, we just talked about James Hurd. None of that would have been possible without his uh, overwhelming Drive, enthusiasm yeah. to, get the, to get the job done. Uh, you, you're not just elite in outcome, you're elite in action and actions, how you prepare and what you do to get there. You can't be a part-time elite athlete. You are either in or you're not. So I look yeah. for that mindset within the individual. When, when a player comes to me, and this can apply to any sport, whether they're a track athlete or a footballer, I've worked with a lot of different sports and it's the same basis. I look at what the individual offers and where can we improve that. Did you find that your knack, lack of familiarity in the AFL initially made it difficult to achieve buy-in from footy players? Um, or was, um, was that overcome by building relationships? No, no, really, really good uh, question, James. I, uh, I think it was honesty at the beginning. Um, I remember standing up in front of the players and I just said to them, I've got no idea about football. But what I do know about is how to get the best out of people. And yeah. uh, that, uh, in fact, I actually told them that uh, um, I, I, my, my exact words to, to the Bombers were, um, some of the most influential people in history have been short. 
in stature. And the one that springs to mind is Hitler. And what you're going to find is that my short stature, I've got more in common with Hitler than just our lack of height. And uh, the, it took the smile <laughs> off their face. They knew they were in for it. But yeah. it, it came to that I, I told the players I didn't know about football, but I knew about getting people fit. I knew about getting them strong. 